Our story takes place in a small Phoenician town known as Stratton's Tower. It was aggressively developed by King Herod the Great into a major port city. He built one of the world's largest man-made harbours. This was a centre of Roman governance in the region. In addition to the artificial harbour, he also built an aqueduct, a palace and a great theatre. The city would come to be named after Herod the Great's uh, patron, Augustus Caesar. Its name, Caesarea. We focus here on a Roman centurion by the name of Cornelius. Roman soldiers were made to be centurions because of their bravery their character, their prowess in battle. A centurion's designated place in battle formation was actually at the very end of the front line. These people were highly esteemed and well paid. This particular Roman centurion named Cornelius, he was a good man. He feared God. He was a Gentile, which means he was a non-Jew, but he did a lot of deeds, we read, for Jewish people. And he prayed to God often. One day, about three in the afternoon, he was at home, I imagine probably praying, when he got a visit from an angel of God. And this angel said, Hey, Cornelius, you've got God's attention. All of those deeds and those prayers have come up to God as an offering. Rising, no doubt, like incense, a pleasing aroma to him. What a beautiful thing that would be to hear, right? You've got God's attention. All those things that you've been doing for people have not gone unnoticed. All those prayers that you've been praying, not one of them has gone unheard. Friends, be encouraged today The same applies to us. Whether or not we have a visit from an angel, doesn't matter. We have faith. We know it's true. You know, we often consider how much God, how God chose Israel, which he did. And then we focus on how much God really loved Israel, which he does. But you know, the reason why God chose Israel and loved Israel was to demonstrate to the world what it was like to be in a relationship with him. Was to reveal to the world who he is. You know, it was to reveal what God is all about. That's the whole point of Israel. And what God is all about is the world. Not just Israel. God wants a relationship with the world. For God so loved the world that he gave us Christ. We see him declare that categorically in these events in Acts chapter 10. The angel tells Cornelius at this meeting, he says, Hey, I want you to send three men to Joppa. Joppa is a little coastal town just down the coast a little bit, about a day, day or so's travel. Send three men there and ask for a guy named Peter. Peter is staying at a friend's house near the sea named Simon the Tanner. But you go and ask for Peter. Okay. He does. He sends three men to Joppa. Meanwhile... In Joppa, verse 9, Peter went up to pray on the roof about noon. A lot of things were done on rooftops. There were stairs going up. This was common. He wasn't being weird. He was just being uh, Jopperish. He went up to pray. 
He became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something, he fell into a trance. He was having a vision. He saw heaven open up and an object that resembled a large sheet coming down, being lowered by four corners to the earth. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and all the birds of the sky. Notice that huge sheet in that vision lowered down with all the animals of the earth, every kind. Now, that gets lost on us because what it really means is it contained both clean and unclean animals. Now, this room might be divided. Some of us would say, hey, every animal's unclean. Those filthy things are not coming in my house. No way. Get that out of here. Whereas some of us probably kiss dogs on the lips to which I would say you're unclean and you're not coming into my house everyone to their own let's move on the significance here is Peter knew that in order to keep the Israelites separate from their idolatrous neighbours God set specific dietary restrictions regarding what animals could be consumed. These animals were therefore called unclean animals. Now, all those animals were on that sheet that was lowered down in that vision. Every animal was on there, even the unclean ones. Verse 13, a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, Kill and eat. (laughs) Kill and eat? Don't you see what's on that sheet? Unclean animals. Verse 14. No, Lord. For Peter said, I've never eaten anything impure or ritually unclean. Now, Peter's reactions, Peter, probably us too, But what I was struck with this week, reading this, for the first time, like none other, was the relationship between Peter and this voice, the Lord's voice. We can think a vision, you know, voice from the heavens, wow, that's mysterious, that's freaky, crazy stuff, like, that's not this voice. This voice is Peter's dear friend. This voice called Peter from his fishing nets. This is the voice of his dear friend that he walked with and ate with and joked with and actually probably played some form of sport with. He confided in. This voice belongs to the one he denied three times at his trial. It belongs to the one who restored him and called him back into service after he appeared to him in his resurrected body. This is the voice that caught him out of the boat. Now, we won't go hard on Peter because he's, we're no better than him, for sure. But when you use the word no, it should not be said to the Lord. (laughs) Conversely, if you're going to use that title, Lord, it shouldn't butt up against the word no. But Peter was caught off guard. As Peter often did, he spoke. And then as he spoke, he started to think about, what will I say? He just reacted. You see, God was doing a new thing here. But Peter was focused on the old thing. No way, Lord. I'm not going to do that. I know the thing. But he didn't know the thing. God was doing a new thing that's superior to the old thing. Peter was looking at Old Testament law. God was focusing on the new covenant in Christ. Now to Peter's credit, 
he moved on in faith. He moved with God. Even though he didn't fully understand this, what a lesson for us. I mean, Peter is awesome. And we can do that too, by the grace of God and the power of his spirit. Move on without fully understanding in faith. Again, verse 15, a second time a voice said to him, what God has made clean, do not call impure. This happened three times. Suddenly, the object was taken up into heaven. Three is a theme in Peter's life, isn't it? He denied Jesus three times. He was restored three times. This happened three times. I don't know what that is, but we'll leave it. What's the point of this whole vision? Is God changing the menu for Israel? For the church? Is he saying, you guys are free now to go and enjoy a pig under the fig? (laughs) We are, indeed, and we take full advantage of that. But Jesus got rid of those Old Testament dietary restrictions in Mark 7, 19. This is not about Old Testament dietary restrictions. This is a metaphor. Dangerous in my hands, I know, but I think I'll get this one right, Neil. God's making possible in the church a unity of both Jews represented by the clean animals and Gentiles, non-Jews, represented by the unclean animals. How is he doing that? He's doing that through the finished work of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, extending forgiveness, therefore inclusion, to the world. For God so loved. The world. We know this because we've read on. In fact, unless any of us are Jews in here today, which you're welcome, but unless we are, we know this because we've been brought into fellowship by the Holy Spirit through Christ. Peter didn't have a clue. We do now. But he didn't then. Look at verse 17. While Peter was deeply perplexed about the vision and what it meant, he was deeply perplexed. Diaporejo is the Greek word. It means baffled. It means absolutely astounded. It actually means entirely at a loss. He didn't need to know, did he? He just needed to follow the Holy Spirit. Trust God on this. You know, sometimes it's tempting for us, I think, to look at these apostles and to look at all the contemporaries of Christ when we read and think, well, it was easy for them to be obedient. They knew him. They touched Christ. They hugged him. They saw him. They heard him preach. They had visions and dreams and angel visitations. Friends, don't believe that lie. We just read, Peter was diaporejo, had no idea, no control. Right at that point, three men from Caesarea are at the gate, shouting up to the rooftop, looking for a guy named Peter. Sent by the God who knows exactly what he's doing and is in complete control of everything at all times. Peter's purpose in this was already planned. But what's apparent is he didn't plan it, did he? God planned it. Peter's purpose, as ours, is planned by God in accordance with his will. That's our purpose, to walk in faith with him. And God's calling Peter to it 
It had nothing to do with Peter's understanding of it. It had everything to do with obedience, which I imagine is something that he learned walking on the Sea of Galilee. Believe it or not, this sermon's about forgiveness, and I'm trying to get there. (laughs) There's a lot on the way. (laughs) We'll get there. As Neil said, we're beginning a series, and this whole story here, this whole journey makes a significant point. Namely, salvation and forgiveness of sin is available to everyone. That is everyone who will receive it through Christ. That's how. That's the only way. We're going to be in forgiveness for four weeks, exploring the implication of God's forgiveness and the function of forgiveness from various angles in the life of the believer. It's great. I'm looking forward to it. Now back to Peter here. He finally gets to Caesarea and he comes to Cornelius' house and he finds that he's packed the house full of family friends and family members and, and they're all just like kind of jammed in there. And when he sees Peter coming, he goes and falls down and worships Peter. Now there's a scene. A Roman centurion running to worship the feet of a Jewish fisherman. Peter immediately and urgently told him, stop, stop, get up, get up man. I'm a man. Don't worship me. I'm a man just like you. Get up. Now there's a telltale sign. Any angel that will receive our worship is demonic. And any person who will receive our worship does not know God. When they got into the house, Peter finds this huge gathering of people. Verse 28, Peter says to them, it's been a crazy couple of crazy week, You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with foreigners or visit. But God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So, may I ask, why are you sent for me? To which Cornelius replies with a detailed description of his whole saga from Caesarea about the vision and the word and the men and the journey and then the lodging and gathering. And he finishes with verse 33. So now we are all in the presence of God to hear everything you've been commanded by the Lord. Wow. Where's my sermon note? Have you ever had the opportunity to share your faith with someone that kind of just sprung up? Peter had a house jam-packed, silent, expectant, looking, listening for the answer for his faith. This moment changed the course of eternity. And if we're serious about following Christ in word and deed as his disciples, we will have moments, plural. There'll be many. In accordance with how we steward the few, there'll be many. Where without warning, the Holy Spirit just brings us into this divine appointment where someone says, I'm ready. Tell me. Why? Why? Do you believe what you believe? That interaction, what comes next, will change the course of eternity. Let's not shrink back from that calling, but pray for it. It's the most horrifying idea of a Christian, I think, 
It's one of the, the you know, people say I'd rather be dead than do the, the wedding speech or the funeral speech or whatever. I think Christians would probably say the same. I'd rather almost be dead than have to go share my faith with someone. At least I could just wait for them and hope they arrive somehow. Let's pursue it. Let's prepare for it. We're growing people. That's what that means. We can't walk our purpose without being growing people, prepared for every divine appointment and every battle and every blessing and every journey. That's why when we do discipleship groups here at Maroubra Baptist, we have our people prepare their testimony of faith in 60 seconds. We don't give you more than that. 60 seconds. Tell me why you believe. The bus is coming. I've got to go. That's the phone. 60 seconds you have. Why? Because God wants to use 60 seconds to change eternity. Peter wrote in his letter, 1 Peter 3.15, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Peter wrote that. I wonder if his mind was cast back to that day in Cornelius' house. <laughs> Is that why he wrote that? Good advice. Peter will now share the gospel of Jesus Christ which, by the way, is the reason for our faith. Everyone in here who has it. It's not because grandma said. It's not because dad made me. Or it makes me feel good. Or it makes me feel safe. Or it makes me feel warm or fuzzy or anything like that. Our journey might have elements of that, but that's not the reason for our faith. The reason is the rock of truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to Peter share it with these outsiders and watch as the Holy Spirit brings them to make them insiders of the kingdom of God. His sermon here covers six headings or falls under six headings which we'll note. No doubt he said more. I would think this was a trimmed down nugget. But listen for these six um, headings. Peter began to speak. Now I truly understand that God doesn't show favoritism. Isn't that beautiful? What a God we have. Everyone included. Everyone welcome. There's no other movement or institution on earth like the church. Our God has no favoritism. But in every nation, the person who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the Israelites, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. Heading number one, the person of Jesus. He's Lord of all. Everything's created by him and for him, and by him they hold together. It's him, and only him. That's who we're dealing with. Amen. He goes on. You know the events that took place throughout all of Judea? Now, he's talking to a Roman centurion. No doubt, he knows the events. This revolutionary life of Christ that turned this whole place upside down. I've probably heard of those events. Beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached. And now we have heading number two. The life of Jesus. What was Jesus' life all about? Listen. How God, an how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. His life was powered by the Holy Spirit and he was sent, anointed by God. He was on mission. That's what his life was all about. And what he did with his life, how he went about 
doing good and healing all who were under the tyranny of the devil because God was with him. That's what his life was all about. Heading number three, the Saviour's death. Verse 39, we ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem. And yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. That's the cross. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. And Peter doesn't take away from that offense or that shame one bit. That's the gospel. He gives it to him. Now, we're familiar with the cross. And we love the cross. But a Roman centurion it was illegal to put on the cross because the cross was so shameful and it was reserved for the worst of the worst. And here's Peter telling Cornelius, this could never happen to you. You're above this. But the maker of heavens and earth, he went to the cross. That's scandalous. He does not flinch. He gives it to him. Heading number four, the resurrection. This is an essential part of the gospel. Without the resurrection, we're still in our sin. If Jesus never rose again, we have no hope. That would, wages of sin is death. If Jesus died and stayed dead, it tells us clearly he had sin. But death couldn't hold him down because he had no sin. He was raised for our justification. And so now... Verse 40, God raised up this man on the third day and caused him to be seen, not by all the people, but by us, whom God appointed as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. This, Cornelius, is not fiction, says Peter. This, Maruva Baptist Church, is not fiction, says Peter. He rose. We saw him. He rose and revealed himself to those who were most able to recognize him. That's us, the disciples. We drank with him. We ate with him. This wasn't a ghost or an epiphany or a vision. This was Jesus. We touched him. He digested food in his new body. It's true. He's alive. Heading number five. The judgment. Jesus Christ is the judge of all. We often see people with t-shirts or tattoos or, or even say, hey, only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. Which means, don't you judge me. That's fine. But we need to know God will judge. He's worthy to judge. It's Jesus. Verse 42, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. No one escapes the judgment of the Lord. That's the gospel. Heading number six, forgiveness. Forgiveness to everyone who believes. Verse 43 All the prophets testify about him, that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. It's through the name of Jesus Christ. There's no other way. That's the most highly exalted name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth and under the earth. Every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's no other way to get through that judgment. And live. It's the name of Jesus. And that's the gospel. But what a moment for this household. The outsiders. 
What a moment to hear that they too are included in God's plan. A plan of redemption. What a wonderful moment for the world to know that all people, not just Jews, not just Israel, not a special chosen, but all people who will come to Christ in faith. Every tribe, every tongue, every colour, every creed, everyone included in God's plan of salvation. Look at this room. Have a go at this mixed bag. I mean, it is like licorice all sorts. Every tr- anyone from the same place? Seriously. My kids are from another planet. I mean, we've got all sorts in here. God's able to reach out. God's able to bring in to right relationship with him. And he wants to. And we enter into it by believing in Christ. He's all those things Peter preached. And under those headings, he's infinitely deep for us to discover. We never will. I'm glad we have eternity. And it will take that long. New things, new depth. The question is, will we receive him as Lord and Saviour today? Then that will change our eternity. It begins with confession, repentance, forgiveness, and continues into the abundant life of discipleship. Forgiveness isn't the goal, actually. It's the doorway. There's a barrier called sin, a chasm we can't breach. Our forgiveness gets us through and removes that barrier. Now we're reconciled to Christ. If we want forgiveness without a relationship with Christ, we won't have that. We'll keep putting the barrier up. The chasm will keep reappearing because of sin. And we just, who doesn't want forgiveness? Who doesn't want to go to hell? The whole planet puts their hand up. I don't want to go to hell, if it exists. I'll take forgiveness, but I don't want a relationship. No, forgiveness is the doorway into a relationship and an abundant eternal life. Don't miss the doorway. It's narrow. It's Christ. The question is not whether it's offered to us, but whether we'll receive the pardon in Christ by believing in him and nothing else. In 1829, a guy by the name of George Wilson robbed a mail carrier, killed him. Wilson faced the death sentence for robbing the mail, but President Andrew Jackson granted him a pardon. However, Wilson declined to accept the pardon. He wouldn't take that offer of grace. All the judges and the lawyers around the states were so dumbfounded, the case ended up in the US Supreme Court. During United States versus George Wilson in 1833, Chief Justice Marshall concluded that, quote, a person, a a pardon is a deed to the validity of which delivery is essential. And delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may then be rejected by the person to whom it is tendered and, if it is rejected, we have discovered no power in a court to force it upon him. God's forgiveness extends to the world, but it won't be forced upon you. We may receive it by accepting that invitation today. We might think that we're beyond hope. There's something in our life that just can't be beaten, certainly can't be forgiven. What God can make clean, don't you call impure? Peter would pass that on. The blood of Christ washes us pure. 
as a monument to man's achievements, both Caesarea and the Roman Empire that sponsored Caesarea are no more. However, the gospel of Jesus Christ that was shared in that town, in that house, that has since changed the world, it still goes on. It's undefeated. It's undefeatable. Let one of those lives be ours today. As we discover the forgiveness of God today, how far it reaches, it reaches to every single human heart in here as an offer will we receive it by faith in Christ. Talk to me, talk to Neil after the service and many others here we could direct you to about what it means to be forgiven. How do we enter into that doorway and that abundant life? We would love nothing more.